Hamilton's physician assistant. So he is in all of Dr. Hamilton's surgeries with him, and he sees uh, most of the patients um, after, he sees most of Dr. Hamilton's patients after surgery for follow-up. And um, so he is here to basically answer any questions that you have um, um, for uh, the surgeons or about the surgery. And usually uh, a lot of people just have little, little questions about different things that are going on. And he's great at answering those. So um, does anybody want to start off with any questions for Dustin? I'll break the ice, and it's sure. really uncomfortable what sure. everyone wanted to Is it common or normal for women to be late for their periods? After surgery? Yeah, after surgery. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cool. So menstrual cycles can change <laughs> after surgery. Um, with uh, weight loss, changes hormo or hormones change with weight loss. Hormones change as a result of going through an operation. So yeah, they can be early, late, more frequent change in heaviness or, you know, and all, I've had all those questions asked and uh, definitely can. Um, as you lose weight, uh, so fat uh, uh, holds estrogen. So as you lose weight, you lose estrogen. So um, a spin off on that too, I tell people to take contraceptives um, before surgery to make sure when they restart those after to talk to their GYN or a prescriber of that medicine because you might need an adjustment on dose. Same with hormones like uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy and such. You may need a different dose. As you continue to lose weight, your stores of estrogen become less and less. So, it's a good question. But yeah, um, most of the time people have a, um, an early cycle after surgery. So, um, something to keep an eye on is uh, while you're on your Lovenox injections, so um, Lovenox injections, pe people that have already had surgery, that's the blood thinning injection you use for a week after surgery. surgery. <laughs> What's that? It's the worst part. Worst part? That's the worst part, that's good, right? Wow, yeah. Yeah. that's the worst part, that is good, because that, I can barely Just see the needle. Just when you have to do it yourself, like I don't need to do it myself. I'm like that, okay. Like, I was okay cool. with someone else yeah. doing it, it's just like yeah. when it came to yeah. me, I picked Still the worst time yourself. too because yeah. like I was like, oh, 10 o'clock, let's do it. And then when no one was home, I'm like, oh, I have to do this by myself. Yeah, well, you're not, if you're not familiar with the time. If you're not very yourself. familiar with insulin so, injections and yeah, stuff, then you yeah, yeah. 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 have to. Listen, I get a lot of questions from patients about birth control. Okay. And how long they have to be off of it beforehand? Because um, a lot of them, they don't know uh, way ahead of time that we we usually ask them 30 days before and now not 30 yeah. days after. And is it a big problem? There's gray areas in the literature as far as how long before, how long after. The main idea with contraceptives is blood clots. So um, let me finish up the last thing I was saying about oh, the sorry. periods. I'll come back to that. But the last thing I was saying about uh, being on your Lovenox injections and starting your early period or starting your period, make sure that um, if, it's, if it's too much, uh, and you start getting weak and dizzy and lightheaded and you're putting out too much blood, then sometimes we have to stop uh, Lovenox injections. Okay, so just keep an eye on that stuff, people that haven't gone through surgery yet. Okay, so back to contraceptives. Um, I think it's best... You can sit if you want. What's that? You can sit. Oh, it's okay. I don't understand it. It's okay. Um, so it, I think it's best to be off two weeks before and one month after. And that's what I tell all my patients that work along beside me and Dr. Hamilton. I, I don't know if Tim, that's Dr. Hohen's PA. So I work with Dr. Hamilton. Tim Stallard works with Dr. Hohen. So you'll meet him after if you're a Dr. Hohen patient. Um, Dr. Aragon and Dr. Strain don't have PAs. So, um, but I, I think it's best to stay off for a month after. Um, you're at increased risk for blood clots um, anyway after surgery. And uh, people that are on contraceptives, it's even a double risk. And so I think it's just safe to stay off for a month. Now, if it is that your symptoms of whatever you're taking it for, and if you're taking it for things other than just birth control, if you're taking it for um, pain and excessive periods, whatever else you take it for, um, 
you know, if you're taking estrogen, and, and contraceptives go in the same category as estrogen and progesterone replacements. That all can increase risk for blood clots. So if your symptoms for uh, menopause or whatever you're taking it for are uh, worse off and you need to restart it, then you just restart it early. So. Most of my, most of my uh, ladies who've been through menopause and they're on hormone replacement therapy are like, please don't take that. I'd rather have the risk of the blood clot, which is extremely low, yes. um, than take me off of it for a month. And in that case, just let us know. I just tell them to hide all the guns in the house. And make sure your other, <laughs> and make sure you, yeah, and if you're off of it, and or if you need to get back on it, just make sure you decrease your other ways for getting blood clots, which would be frequent sedent, sedentary lifestyle. Make sure you're up and moving around. You monitor for pain in your calves and stuff like that. So, so a little bit about me before I answer any questions. I So I like I said, there's two PAs that work um, and uh, alongside in the practice with Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Owen. Uh, after surgery, you're mainly followed by the PAs. So if you haven't had surgery yet, all you've seen is the doctors. After surgery, you'll only see the PAs unless you request to see one of the doctors or you have problems. The reason why we do that is because we want to be able to see and operate on as many patients as, many patients as we can. And if the doctors saw everybody after surgery, then we wouldn't be able to do uh, surgery on as many people as we, as we want to. So, and, and Tim and I do a great job for coaching people through the follow-up process. So, um, as far as what we do, uh, uh, Tim and I operate alongside Dr. Hohen and Dr. Hamilton, so it takes two people to do these operations, so we do the operations together, and uh, we've done a lot of them together, so we work very well together. So our relationships with our doctors is, is such that... So continuing on contraceptives. Let's talk about a little bit about pregnancy. Sure. What is the guideline? And if a person becomes pregnant before, is recommended? What things to look for? Um, okay. So I don't, there's not really a hard and fast rule on when you should get pregnant after. I don't know if you tell them such in the education meeting. Yeah, if you can. Yeah, at least if it a year happens. is what I say. If it happens, congratulations. Okay. It <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's good. So make it clear there's no risk. Yeah. Yeah. So I have that question a lot. So if yeah, so if it does happen, then the first thing I would do, it, I always tell people, once you get pregnant, you find out, call Laura or Michelle, <laughs> and make sure that your calorie intake is what it's supposed to be and your vitamin intake is what it's supposed to be, because. Um, you need more than just bariatric vitamins, obviously, for being Clinical pregnant. medical is all good, right? Yeah, everything's fine. You're not going to do, nothing's going to damage your sleeve or your, your gastric pouch or anything like that. Uh, you can totally be pregnant. I saw a lady today. She's doing fine. She's one year out. Uh, she's pregnant. She's doing great. So, so you'll want to make sure that you're monitoring your, your weight gain with your GYN uh, because it's harder to take in enough calories to support the baby and yourself, and so you'll you'll want to make sure that that's monitored closely, so you're gaining weight appropriately. So, I have a question on that. I don't know if any post-patient uh, relates to this pain. You know, all of a sudden I hear, you know, I get phone calls. Oh, now I'm with, I'm in pain. Is this normal? Or lately I've been having heartburn. Is this a problem? Or what should I do? You know, okay. I go over diet and. Red flag for something that's a problem. That's, that's a problem. Sorry. Um, that there's something. Very that, that there's something that they need to call me about. Exactly. Okay. Sure. Where's the fine line? Yeah. So there, and I have several people that come in, you know, for their follow-up visit. I've been drinking liquid for the past two months. I can't get anything down. Well, you didn't call me. I mean, it's easy to just make a phone call if you're not, if something's not seeming right not eating appropriately, it's hurting when it's going down, it's causing you tons of reflux, then you need to call Tim, or I, Tim or I, and we need to let you know whether we need an EGD or we need to start you on some medicine. Um, 
it's not common, but it can happen after bypass that you get an ulcer inside your stomach. The reason why that can happen uh, soon after surgery and the reason why we put you on omeprazole or the, the proton pump inhibitor or the antacid, whatever you want to call it, we'll put you on that for two months after surgery. And the reason why is because your intestines are bypassed 100 centimeters. And so that small intestine that's 100 centimeters normally away from your stomach is now hooked right up to your stomach. And that's not used to seeing any acid because it's normalized by the time it gets 100 centimeters down the road. And so uh, the minute that small intestine sees an acid, it gets an ulcer like that, okay? So pain when swallowing or feeling like food's getting stuck in your stomach or excessive reflux, anything like that is abnormal. You should call us and find out if it's, if it's, if it's you should be having those symptoms. What about hiccups? Um, how often? Um, every time I eat a little too much or a little too fast. Sure, sure. And, and so that it, it didn't happen until literally only a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. So you're probably overeating by one or two bites. Okay, so so uh, picture the esophagus. I'm holding up an esophagus here, and I'm just holding it out outside of somebody's body hooks up to the stomach or the pouch here. If I were to pour water in the esophagus, it would not just fall down on gravity, okay? It has to literally be milked all the way down to the stomach, okay? So if you take, if you start stacking bites in there, or you try to take drinks on top of your food to try to push it through, it's not gonna happen. It's gonna gurgle back up. And that's usually the first case for somebody that's having reflux, is they're trying to take bites on top of bites that haven't gone into the sleeve or haven't gone into the pouch yet and they're squeezing back up. So everything has to be milked down the esophagus all the way through the intestines. That's how the GI tract works. And so if you're eating too fast or you're taking one bite too many, then it's gonna either gurgle or bubble up or you're gonna feel a hiccup because it's telling you that you're overfilling that. Or you sometimes, or you, yeah. Or you now sometimes people have what, what's called a soft sign, okay? And we notice, I'd say we notice that most often in patients that have bands, lap bands, having soft signs. Um, but other people can have it too. So slow down, chew well, eat slowly, and listen for a hiccup or a, or a, or a, a, a sigh or runny nose, anything like that. Um, and I would be done at that point. Don't try to take one more bite, even if you feel like you can fit more. You know, the hiccups have taught me how to eat. I mean, I've, they're kind of a gift because I used to get them a lot, uh -huh. and now I'm much more kind of aware of when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And if I get one now, it's like I know I'm done. So I think it's great to have yeah. that. I didn't like it at first. Yeah. I guess I'm too. Three hiccups. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Got it now. Three, it's just a great one, signal. Get... And it I'm takes time. It it's not. Stop. It's, like, it's not going to happen right away where you where you relearn how to eat or you relearn listen to your body for certain signs like that. Um, it takes some time to learn that. Well, how long does it take before? Um, I know it takes like six to eight weeks for the tissue to really grow out the staples and for everything to completely heal. At what point do they have a sense of how much they can eat at one meal? Long term. Long term. Long -term. Exactly. At what well, point can they say? Yeah. Yeah. Well, eight to ten six months after? No, I'd say it's even sooner than that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I would say by um, uh, maybe not quite two months, but maybe in the two to three month period. Really? I'd say that most people feel like they are able to eat their three to four ounces of a good solid protein three meals a day. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And like at any one meal, how, what quantity, if they were trying to say, can I eat? Uh, a half a cup or a quarter of a cup at one time. Yep, I say three to four ounces, so about the, the size of a half a chicken breast. Okay. That would be a meal. Maybe a little bit of vegetables to go with it, but uh, yeah. when you get to that point. But, so four ounces is but, a half a cup, so you would say. That would be, okay. That's your protein source. Okay. Yep. And the uh, tissue is healed. I mean, I, I tell everybody two months. I use the two month period. You know that this staple line that goes along your sleeve or the staple line that defines the pouch um, it grows together sooner than that but it's just easier for me to say two months because you come back in for your follow-up visit 
and you can stop omeprazole at two months if you're doing fine and I can tell you at that point your staples inside the sleeve and on the pouch aren't doing anything anymore. The stomach's grown back together like it was never cut. So. Is it bad to continue omeprazole because I'm still thinking of no, sometimes, say, sometimes people know. have to. I can feel burned. Like yeah. I decided to eat Indian food the other day. Yeah, so it, it can be, um, so did you have reflux before surgery? No. No, okay. But I mean, I noticed when I didn't take it, and this is a couple of weeks ago, and man, it hurt. And I was like, where's the Santa? You know, just, I was just looking for something. Yeah. It was a my personal that like that saved me. So, and that was a one-time occurrence? Yeah, because it never stopped on my personal again. Like I run out okay, so when you stop Omeprazole, yeah, so like that's when it started back up. Okay, so sometimes people need to go longer than the two months on their Omeprazole. Sometimes it's the um, uh, the weight that still needs to come off more that's causing the intra-abdominal pressure pushing and stuff up. Okay, we'll get more weight up. Yeah. So that's the main so. reason for the heartburn? What's that? The reason for the heartburn? Reason for it? Um, I mean, there's eating too action. fast, yeah. overeating. Um, or just you have too much intra-abdominal pressure still that's forcing stuff up. I mean, I don't know why sometimes people that had none, re no reflux before have it after. And it's more of burn um, inside the stomach. Like burn, you, you said? Yeah. Like you just yeah, burn. so in that case, uh, are you one of my patients? Or Dr. Home or Aragon? Okay. So I think it would be worth it to start on, sometimes we start people on Carafate, have people heard of that? Sucralfate, Carafate. Yeah. So sometimes the lining, are you asleep? Yes. Okay, sometimes the lining of the stomach can get irritated and with more of that burning sensation in there, makes me think that the linings get irritated. So I would talk to Dr. Aragon about starting on a, on a medicine to heal the lining of your sleep. Because okay. you shouldn't feel a burning sensation. Okay. Is it whether you eat or not? Or just when you eat? I don't know. No, really just pay attention to it a little bit more. No smoking. Okay. Yes. So why do alcoholic beverages affect us so much after the surgery? <laughs> why do what now? <laughs> why, do why is your tolerance way low? Yeah, like why can I only have two sips of wine and I need to worry yeah. about walking now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the yeah, I don't know the physiologic <laughs> reason behind that. Uh, I don't know. I don't get problem. it. You don't have that problem? No. Yeah. Yeah. Like I tried wine last week or the week before, and it almost felt like I was like, I'm two and a half weeks out, two yeah. and a half months out. So yeah. I should be. But it like it's like, oh, did I just drink alcohol? You know, like alcohol. But what was wine? It wasn't. Yeah. No, seriously. On one of the blogs I follow, a lady got pulled over for drunk driving after she had to sleep with only one glass of wine, and she did get a DUI for it. Yeah. And so her. Her advice on this blog was don't drink and drive, which is good advice, but before the surgery, one yeah. glass of wine wouldn't have been a thing that she fine. would have been concerned yeah. about. I don't know the answer of it, but why. You know, I just yeah. tell people, your tolerance is less, I, but I don't know the exact reason. It has to do with abstraction. I know okay. um, when we said, I explained, you know, not, do not eat and drink, you know, because of right. the gastric emptying. I don't and, yeah. people, and, and then if you eat and drink, really your macros, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, they're all absorbed in your intestine. So alcohol actually is the only um, component that gets absorbed in, absorbed in your stomach. And that has to do with the change in the absorption rate and how fast you get, because once it's absorbed from your stomach and you have such small capacity, that increases the chances of getting absorbed directly to your bloodstream and affecting your Level of intoxication. Thank you. I needed a scientific answer. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing absorbing your stomach directly to your bloodstream is alcohol. Thank Any you. Any other markers Oh, that might be a concern. 
anything typical that you see? Yeah. I so, have that question quite a bit. Yeah, what is, yeah what's an ulcer and what's uh -huh. not? So what um, if you have an ulcer in your stomach, you, it's going to feel like everything gets stuck in your stomach. Everything hurts when it goes down, and it feels like it gets stuck, okay? And it wants to come right back up. It's because an ulcer is like a big crater, canker sore, I don't know how you want to describe it, sore on the inside lining of your small intestine or the anastomosis, which is the hookup of the small intestine to the pouch. Um, it gets a sore right there, and it does not want to see food or liquid. So if that's the case, everything's coming back up, whether you sip slow or chew well or take a small bite or anything like that. Warm liquids, cold liquids, it doesn't matter. Everything wants to come back up and everything hurts, then that's a red flag for so either an ulcer problem. or a stricture, okay? And ulcers usually happen before strictures, okay? Ulcers we treat with medicine, strictures we treat with dilation or um, doing an EGD. What you do before surgery, we go in there with a little balloon and we stretch it back out. If you do that, how long would it, is, is there any way that the body will get back to that structure or typically it's resolved? Uh, when we dilate, uh -huh. sometimes it takes a couple times to dilate. It depends on how tight the structure is. I've seen ones that are pinpoint um, and have required three or four different dilations over, a, over a every two week period because we can only dilate it so far. If we dilate it too much at one time, then we rip it open, and that's not good. So, um, and that's been done. So, um, so you got to go slow. Uh, after the dilation process, you want to make sure you're on the Carafate and Omeprazole too. Um, we will start you on those things when you get dilated, um, but you got to make sure you take them because if you don't, then it's going to stricture right back down. So. Usually, if you think you have an ulcer, the best thing to do is just call Tim or I or the surgeon that, or Dr. Aragon or Strain. Um, explain the symptoms over the phone and the way I do it, Tim might be different. I don't schedule an EGD right away. I treat you conservatively with medicine because it's either going to get better or it's not. And if it gets better in two weeks on Carafate, then it's an ulcer and just finish the full month out of Carafate. If it doesn't get better in that two weeks, then I need to look with an EGD. So just call me. So I'll tell you the same spiel. Here's Carafate for two weeks. If it doesn't get better, you need to call me. So make sure you do call us if it's not better in two weeks. I, I had a friend of mine that had this uh, procedure about 12 or 13 years ago. Uh -huh. And not here, somewhere else. Uh -huh. But he got a new job where he was walking a lot. And he started taking a bunch of ibuprofen. Uh -huh. they, they told him never to take ibuprofen. I can't remember. Is that... Is that yeah. pretty um, A bunch of ibuprofen, yes. I would not take a bunch of ibuprofen. So here's the rules on ibuprofen. It, it, it says in the booklet, don't ever take I don't know if it does, if it says never take ibuprofen again. That's not, it's not really the case to never take it again. Um, I wouldn't take it for two months. After surgery, I would not take any ibuprofen, whether you're a sleeve or a bypass. Tim might say it a little bit differently, but um, yeah, I, I think the safest thing because in those two months, you're taking omeprazole because you're trying to protect the staple line from getting irritated. That's the point of taking the omeprazole. The omeprazole is not for heartburn occasionally or anything like that. It's literally to keep acid off the staple line while it's healing, okay? So it's healed in two months, you come off omeprazole. Um, uh, where was I going with that? When can we take oh, ibuprofen. So at the two month period, your staple line's healed. Um, it's okay to take ibuprofen here and there, especially with a sleeve. The sleeve is a normal stomach like it was before. Your chances for getting an ulcer are very low in a sleeve. It's mainly with bypasses. Okay. Yeah, he, he had the ruined wives. So yeah. He took a lot. He got he had three units of blood. He was in ice. Oh, yeah. So that's a bleeding ulcer is what that is. So, so ibuprofen can definitely do that, and it's because it goes in there and sits on the anastomosis or the opening of the pouch, and it irritates, and it causes an ulcer, and ulcers can turn into bleeding ulcers. So, and those are life-threatening. Um, but it's okay at two months to take ibuprofen here and there, as long as it's not on a routine basis. If you're taking it on a routine basis, yeah, I think it's best to take with food. If you're taking it on a routine basis, then I would be taking an antacid along with it twice a day, omeprazole. And if you take the omeprazole, how long before you can take the ibuprofen? Uh, I just, I tell you, that, it, that I wouldn't correlate that because okay. the omeprazole is just one of those things that just stays in your system every 12 hours. So I would just take omeprazole morning and night.
no no relation to when you're taking it. Yeah. Since I just came in, I have a question. Sure. What are typical complications for this lead? Typical complications? None. There are no typical complications. <laughs> Anything atypical is a complication. <laughs> yeah, and, and do we expect any complications with the sleeve? No. no. We don't expect any complications with any of the surgeries. Extremely rare. Have you had surgery? No, no. I'm down 150 pounds. No, wow. I had the sleeve last year. No. And no complications whatsoever. That's incredible. No. There you go. Do it. <laughs> 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 I have a question for you. All you have to do is follow this book. You follow the book and really follow the book. You can't do anything but follow this book and you will be successful. And we'll break into groups so you can have one session. Yeah. So you can get an idea of the This is your Bible. Yes, and maybe you can address um, yeah. the swelling in the stomach from the surgery itself oh, yes. and how long it takes for that sure. swelling. To sure. Sure. So, yeah. Day one after surgery, when you're sipping on liquids, it's because the opening to either your sleeve or your pouch is about the size of a straw. So um, it, it, you're going to feel a lot of gurgling and bubbling at that time when you drink. You're going to feel pressure right in the center of your chest. That's where the esophagus turns into the sleeve or into the pouch. And uh, that's where all the swelling is. So as you're able to advance your diet, that's the swelling going down. So at the end of week one, when you're able to eat eggs, refried beans, cottage cheese, and yogurt, you wouldn't be able to eat that at day one after surgery. Okay, so the swelling isn't completely down, but it's down enough to get a little bit more consistency now. So protein shakes at day three or day four, somewhere in there. Uh, but the swelling there is just a normal reaction to us stapling right next to it and irritating and it inflames and blood vessels dilate and all that stuff. And can so. you give an idea on the size of the sleeve itself to compare? Uh, at, when they're healed, healed or day one? Healed. When they're completely healed? Uh, or make a comparison. So we yeah, can see so we the can the it's picture. hard on a sleeve. Uh -huh. um, I would say it's about the size of a banana. A peeled banana. In thickness? In, in like length. In and then, length. Okay. and then the diameter of a banana, I'd say that's about the diameter of your sleeve. Okay. Got it. How long does and it the take? only reason I know that is because we do we do uh, EGDs after surgery, and so we kind of have an idea of what it looks like. I mean, that's about the length. You know, how much stomach do we take out when we do a sleeve? We say about 80%, but everybody's removal of their portion of stomach is a different size. That's and what I was and the amount of stomach right? that we take out has no correlation to how big you were to start. So 400-pound people, we might take a stomach out that's this big. 200-pound people, we might take out a stomach that's this big. I mean, it has exactly. no no bearing on anything. It's okay, just 80%. You just and see what the stomach looks like. And the doctor decides at that point how much they're taking? Actually, no, we use a size. Have you had surgery yet? Yes. You've had, okay, so we use a sizing device. So we put like a banana shaped device that's real long all the way down into the sleeve and we staple next to it. Huh. Did so you it's about down the down same down? size for everybody, right? You didn't know that? Nobody knew that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I read the books. Like, like, okay. Waist so, yeah. to measure it's like a big snake. Business. So it's like a big <laughs> snake. It's the same thing that a GI doctor would use to dilate somebody if they had like um, esophageal strictures. Um, sometimes people would put these, it's a, like a big rubber solid tube and it's, it's, it's a 34 French bougie. If you, you can look why up that do, Why do they talk, people talk about different sizes? Like if you read yeah. about stuff, people had different sizes. 32s and 36s yeah, yeah. and stuff like so that. So okay. do you guys so, use different sizes? Yeah, so no, we only use one, oh. 34. And that's because yeah. in the literature, yeah. 36 is too big and 32 is too small. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's literally, that's the, that was the decision. So um, 32 was too small and people had risks of... Average. Um, not being yeah. able to get stuff down, and 36 was big enough that it wasn't good enough weight loss. Okay. Do you do that so, with Ruin Y also? Uh, no, Ruin Y's, uh, we use, at the beginning of the case, we, we put down a balloon um, that blows up about the size of an egg inside the stomach. 
Uh, we, we blow that up in the stomach and then we have the CRNA, which is the nurse anesthetist or the anesthesiologist, pull that back um, to the top of the stomach where it meets up with the esophagus and we're able to staple right next to that. Now it just gives us an idea and then we go where we want to go. But we know we won't really need to have that sizing device. It's critical for the sleeve uh, to have the, the, uh, the long stake device in there. But the other one, it's not critical. We just use that at the beginning to give us an idea where we want to go. We pretty much go where we, we think we can go safely, uh, according to where blood supply is, so we don't get into a lot of bleeding. Um, but we look at enough of them, we can just look and go, yeah, we need to go right there. I mean, we can see dotted lines in our mind. <laughs> and what's the size of a bypass then? What's that? I'd say about the size of a large egg. Okay, there you go. And I, I'd say that um, if we were to do a surgery on you and not tell you what you had, you wouldn't be able to know whether you had a sleeve or a bypass. That's what I tell people. Because some people are trying to, over the, you know, the fence, trying to figure out, if I do a bypass, I can't eat as much. If I do a sleeve, I'll be able to eat more. And that's not the case. You won't be able to eat any more with a bypass, with a sleeve, vice versa. You won't know the difference, other than with a bypass, you're gonna have better weight loss, because uh, it's a malabsorptive component, and it's gonna cure a little bit more medical problems, diabetes, and such. So, but the surgeon will figure out the best surgery for you. Yeah. Um, when you lose, start losing a lot of weight, I wonder about, like, I had a hernia repair, mm -hmm. So, Before surgery? Oh yeah, many many years ago. Okay. And so I have a piece of mesh in there, and my stomach is significantly smaller now. What's happening to that mesh? mesh. Anything else you might have in, underneath your skin? Nothing. It's staying right where it is. So it's not going to cause any problems in there. Okay. It could be that um, when you lose weight, that hernia kind of changes and reappears with the oh. with the movement of the mesh a little bit, but it shouldn't. Now we won't, uh, if you have a hernia before surgery and then we do a weight loss surgery, we, won't, we don't recommend fixing a hernia until you're done losing weight. And the reason why is because if we do your bypass and you start losing weight and you want a hernia fixed and we go in there and fix it and put a piece of mesh in, it's probably going to change to the point we have to redo the mesh later. So I would not, but if you've had one before, then I wouldn't worry yeah, about it. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about anything like that. I don't feel like I can see it now. Uh, Probably not. Mesh, you could not. I don't think you can see mesh. I mean, you can feel it or no? Maybe. Okay. There, there's probably scar tissue below there. Okay. Yep. What yep. if you do have the hernia and it's so? I have a hernia, had it before. The surgeon for the hernia repair said they won't fix the hernia until I lose enough weight. Okay. Um, but we would say the same thing. Uh, well, it went from that big, and then I had got really. It's literally this is that the entire big. hernia. Yeah. And they told me that it needs to get it repaired sooner rather than later. Yeah. And so. And you haven't had your. I've had. I'm, I'm down 68 pounds oh, in 11 great. weeks. Oh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. So, yeah. So, doing. So you're good. wondering when to get it fixed? Yeah. Like I, I went already for my two month, and and I, my family's asking me because. I don't know how serious it is now. I don't have pain since, like, before the surgery. I was having pain. It was From horrible. the hernia? Yeah. And now I don't have pain anymore. I've been cleared by Tim mm -hmm. to be able to, like, I work at a pet resort. I've been cleared to be able to handle big dogs again. I've been, I mean, I don't have any problems, but it's my there. fiance, like, he'll put his hand on my stomach and he'll feel it. Feel it, yeah. And it just freaks him out. So yeah. I'm a little nervous, like, do I yeah, so I wouldn't, I, I would not fix it until it's bothering you to the point where you want it fixed and it's causing you problems. If it's painless and you're not having any bowel problems from it, I wouldn't fix it. And the Does bigger the hernia, the better the hernia. Really? Uh, the, yeah, uh, from a complication standpoint. Okay. <laughs> the smaller it is, the smaller it is, the more chance that you're going to get its intestines stuck in it and cause a bowel obstruction. It was if it's really big, little. like the size of your fist, then stuff's just going. It's probably just full of fat, and it's probably not going to cause you any problems. Okay. Until you lost your weight, and then we put a piece of mesh in. If you do it now, then later you're going to want it redone or you'll because to it's going to change. Okay. It's probably going to keep getting bigger as you. It'll keep getting bigger. I think so. Okay. Yeah. The difference between that kind of a hernia and a hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernia, sure. So an abdominal wall hernia is something that's a defect in the in the 
closure layer, keeping your guts on the inside from coming out. I had half my liver removed explain. two years ago, and so it's from. Yeah, the it's usually hernia. from a previous incision. <laughs> yeah, so whether it's an, an open incision hernia. or a laparoscopic incision, it's a uh, so the fascia layer, which is the layer that keeps everything on the inside in and everything on the out out. Um, that layer has been broken down, and it allows for either fat or intestines to come through it. And you can usually see it on the outside, or you can feel a spot that feels um, uh, feels like something's sticking out of it. And when you push it, it goes away, and then it pops back out. It usually happens when you stand up or you bear down. You feel kind of something pop out. That's a that's a dominal wall hernia, and that's something where you need a piece of mesh to fix it. But like I said, I wouldn't fix it until you lost a lot of weight. Um, hiatal hernia is a, uh, an opening uh, in your diaphragm, that's the muscle that contracts to allow you to breathe. Um, there's a hole there, a natural hole for the esophagus to meet up with the stomach. If that hole's too big, it allows for stomach to go up into your chest. Um, we look for those every time we do an operation, whether a sleeve or a bypass, because if we don't, and we don't fix it at the times, then it's not going to go well. Your sleeve is not going to work appropriately with an unfixed hiatal hernia. Um, and so we will fix it at that time. And the best way to see a hiatal hernia is during the time of operation. It's not on your EGD now. You can see one on an EGD. Um, and we will tell you if we see one on an EGD, like a pre-op EGD. Sometimes your pre-op EGD will, will reveal a big enough hiatal hernia that if you're wanting to get a sleeve, we recommend you do a bypass. Because if it's big enough, then we've done enough of these that we know that the sleeve is not going to work right with a big enough hiatal hernia. You need a bypass. And a bypass is kind of the gold standard operation for a hiatal hernia. So, so too much stomach up in the chest, we do a sleeve, you're going to have trouble swallowing after surgery. It's just a problem. So, um, so we look for those every time. Now, um, if we do see one during the operation and we're doing a sleeve, we're not going to automatically do a bypass. Um, usually we can just fix that and just do that a sleeve at the same time. If it's bad enough that we see it on your EGD, then it's a significant hiatal hernia. And if either Tim or I or Hamilton Home and whatever, whoever recommends you switch to a bypass, probably in your best interest. So, yes? I have a sharp pain in the middle of my back. Okay. And I don't know what causes it. Are you pre op, post op? Uh, post op. So okay. it's left. It's right in the middle of my back. How, how far out? No, it's like, I don't know. How far out from surgery are you? This is my eighth week. Eighth week? Okay. But I've had it for quite a while. Not associated with eating? No fevers? Have you mentioned it to your surgeon or? Uh, yes, I mentioned it to him, but I hear back from Okay. So my arm is sitting next to me. Okay. I just heard that that was normal at home. Oh, man. Uh, mid abdominal pain and back pain. It could be a several normal things. It could be some abnormal things, but with no other symptoms along with it, right? You feel fine otherwise? I mean, sometimes, you know, like the normal things when you eat too fast, you know, it gets stuck in your throat. You have that every time? No. You get solids down just fine? It's, it's texture sometimes, but it's not. That's gonna, you know. Okay. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to, you know, I think it would be easy to eat four times four ounces, but that's hard. It's hard for me. I don't drink by 64 ounces. Yeah. Okay. It takes time to eat these right. It's still a lifelong habit. It's, really yeah. Breaking a lifelong habit. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, I would just mention that mid back pain to yeah. whoever did your surgery. Yeah. Sometimes it warrants a CT scan. Yes. I take, so I haven't had my surgery yet. Okay. But when I get to that point where it's two weeks of liquids before the surgery, I take lots of medicine. Okay. Like my sheet of pills is a oh. full notebook sheet. Diabetes medicine or high blood pressure medicine or? And epilepsy and fibromyalgia 
And who's your who's a whole your, bunch of who's your surgeon? Aragon. Aragon, okay. And but and especially then after surgery. You're wondering about how to do all those things. Do pets. all sure. that because I know I can't. I'm I'm planning on losing enough to get rid of everything except my ele uh, epilepsy sure. medicine. Uh, maybe my thyroid. I don't know. Are you on insulin too? No. No. Okay. I'm on pills. Okay. And when? How far out until your surgery? It will be in the first part of July. Okay. Uh, but then, when I hold my hand, it's full of pills. Yeah, you won't take all those after surgery. And so... I'll get to stop some of them immediately after. Yeah, so it depends on whether you're, where your surgery is. Do you know, have you had it scheduled yet? No. Okay. I um, just, just am finishing up every stuff. Day. Okay. So most likely, um, Dr. Cerati, most of you or some of you have met him. He's an internal medicine doctor, bariatrician. Mm -hmm. uh, we consult him after surgery on most of our patients. Um, and uh, he will adjust medicines for you. Okay. And so yeah, because all my other doctors have said. Continue everything. Ask your surgeon. Ask your surgeon. <laughs> yeah. So, to, so Nicole, that's the scheduler. Uh -huh. She's going to tell you what you need to stop. Uh, have you been through your education class yet? Yeah, I've been through okay. everything. I only need one more uh, release from my heart doctor. It's the only one I don't have yet. Okay. And, and I'm having knee so, replacement a week from today. So when's so, your two week before visit with Dr. Aragon? It hasn't been said okay. yet. So when you see him at that two week before visit, mm -hmm. bring your medicine list and ask him what he want, what to stop and continue. The hospital's going to tell you what to take the day of surgery. Right. There's plenty of people that tell you what to continue and what to stop. But after surgery, don't worry, you're not going to swallow a handful of pills. It's going to be way less. There, there won't be room. Correct. It'll be way less. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say, um, so I went to my primary doctor after my surgery and I had some hormonal issues that were unusual for me. Uh -huh. And my primary doctor, she just kind of off basically mm -hmm. and so then I came to a support group and I talked to um, Chris and told her you know the story about myself that's not formal for me anyway so what I didn't know is that Dr. Sarabi is a primary care clerk and so I chose to, to I now he's my primary care because it yep. makes sense to me that he will know everything in this building, oh. so he will understand what I'm going through. Whereas my other primary, she just thought she just kind of beat me off. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good. He's a yeah. Good so guy. I think that people, like I didn't know that he was a primary. Yeah. Surgery surgeon or primary. And most surgeon. people meet him after surgery at their at their day after when he comes and sees them. Actually, day of surgery, um, he comes and, and rounds on you. As nurse practitioner Whitney does, she's great too. So. But yeah, they're great primary cares, and they're in our our other office, which is on the third floor. So I just highly well. recommend that if you have any problems with your primary doctor, to switch because the Sarati, if you meet him, he's just funny. He's a funny yep. guy. Yeah, he's awesome. I love him. But he's the same. Yeah. They listen to everything you say, and the good thing is, is that they're going to help us support us get through this new yep. transition in our life. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yep. They're on our team. That's right. They are. Don't stay with team. a primary care provider that's against what you're doing. Because there's plenty that are out there. There's plenty of primary care so that say, don't get that surgery. So far, all and there's no doctors reason. are very happy with good. me. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Yes, ma'am. Treadmill. I mean, so you go home the day after, you should, 
walking around your house for a few days, by the end of that first week, maybe down to the mailbox and back, and then the second week, go around the block, you know, every other day, and I mean, just slowly advance. If you do something that wears you out, then um, I wouldn't do it. I would back off. If your left side starts hurting, then that's your gauge to stop because your left side's going to hurt. I promise you. Um, Elliptical's fine. Stairs are fine. The only thing I wouldn't do is core body stuff for about four weeks, which means crunches, sit ups, those kind of things. So. Yeah. Well, that's five years. <laughs> I work from home. Sure. So will it be like okay for me to work? I so doubt you'll want to work the first week. You know, it's it's. You think that sitting in a chair would be easy? No. Sitting in a chair is not really that comfortable. <laughs> Mainly because your left side hurts so bad. So. Um, it's, it's, you're going to have to just, I, I tell people I don't think you should go back till you see me at your one week off. I think you concentrate on your eating too, like for me, I mean, I have to really concentrate. Oh, there's a lot of stuff to juggle that first week. Yeah. Is it time to drink? Is it time to take a pill? Is it time to... <laughs> With injections? Injection, food, I mean, walk. There's a lot of stuff to get used to that first week. Okay, so I got another question. Sure. I was just diagnosed two days ago with diabetes. Okay. Okay, we'll fix it. It'll be gone. Better for St. Care. It'll be gone. Are you on oral medicine? Yeah, you'll be off. You'll be off of it the day after surgery. One for diabetes and one for Okay, you'll be off both of them. Yeah, no problem. Are you doing bypass or sleep? Or do you not know? Sleep? Great. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. So it's about like bowel. Huh? And I I've been not regular before, so I feel like it's really bad now. And what you weren't regular before, or you were not. We're not okay. So like, what fine. is considered maybe bad? Yeah. So That's don't get. Not, okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Keep going back. No, no, you're fine. Okay. So uh, it's okay to not go every day. I mean. It's okay to wait a couple days, but um, I think adding fiber into your diet is the most important thing. Fiber, either Miralax, Daily, or Stool Softener, Metamucil, Fiber Con, something like that. They make them gummies, chewies, whatever you want. Um, I think Miralax works the best. Um, I heard that the, how often is Miralax? Daily. Whether you go or not. I and that doesn't cause like any like stomach. until you get into more roughage in your diet. But I mean, with a high protein diet and literally no fiber or low fiber, uh, it's not uncommon to have irregular bowel movements or constipation. Um, you are going to have it on pain medicine. I mean, that's just that's the negative oh. effect of pain medicine. So don't take pain medicine unless you have to. So. And our antibiotics have probiotics. Yep, they have probiotics. Yep. So at least once every other day they should do everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want you to get worked up about trying to figure out, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, if you don't feel constipated, then you don't need to go. I mean, it's not something that is, you're going to hurt anything by it. I mean, if you get constipated, then you need to give yourself something. At least the but, way I say this, the frequency of the stool will change because the volume of this will change, right? Yeah. And the bulkiness of the, the stool will change as well. Of course, you know, we've changed the amount of solid you're eating, so there's not much coming in, there's not much coming out. The problem becomes if you're dehydrated, Correct. it's gonna harden the stool, right? That becomes really like constipation issue, the bleeding, the stool is kind of a little, little rock, that's dehydration. But if you wanna keep it going, Miralax will help, et cetera, but it's, it's a common symptom of dehydration. Dehydration and ambulation. And ambulation, exactly. And those two things, so. But expected, it's pretty common the first week after surgery because of pain medicine and all the button pain medicine in the hospital and all that mm -hmm. stuff. If you're not eating anything solid, it's all liquid. Um, a lot of people their first week haven't even had a bell. So I don't get too worried yeah, about that. Yeah, my first 24 hours. Yeah. So don't let yourself get to the point that you're so constipated that it hurts or you're straining or anything like that. I mean, the first thing I would do if you're to the point where you're that plugged up is a suppository. 
you can give yourself all this oral stuff. The problem is way down low. And it's usually hard stool in the in the rectum. So you need to just give yourself a suppository and get it going. Yeah, but I'm one that was born constipated. And you're going to... I mean, literally. Don't take pain medicine. Or start taking Miralax well, the day of your liquid diet. I eat right now. I eat. Right. Start yeah, taking, yeah, start right. taking Miralax. Exactly. Even on the liquid diet. Even on the liquid diet. You think that a liquid diet would cause diarrhea? Not really. It does not. <laughs> <laughs> it does not. Yeah. So. I've been on lots of pain medicine, but as I said, I don't go but once a week anyway. Yeah. So Maybe that's your norm. But it's always In concrete. It's always Concrete. Yeah, then you should be giving yourself daily Miralax. Because I eat every raw fruit and vegetable there is, and granola, and all kinds of yeah. other fiber. Fiber, and, but it just doesn't. I, but I've done that all my life. Okay. So after the surgery, if I don't go for two weeks, it's okay. Don't wait that long. Yeah. It's suppository. Take that Miralax. Yeah. 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 I'm going to change gears. Change gears. We're off poop now. Yes. Okay. It's it's my just that only has a couple more minutes and then he has to leave. So. It's my understanding that doctors will cut off the excess of the huh? skin. Yep. Do you assist in that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Is it the um, healing time any different than going to like a, a regular plastic surgery? surgeon? Yeah. So what's the time? I have that Cheaper here, and we do just as good. <laughs> <laughs> what's the uh, you guys yeah. only do stomach, so Yeah, too. we only do stomach. So if you're wanting to do more than just stomach, then I would go somewhere else. But because you're going to get, they'll make deals with you on arms and breasts and stuff like that. If they want to do other stuff, then, it, then it, you can, you can. I want to do this and that, and they change the price, I mean, based on that stuff. And you can do multiple things during one operation. So I would just go somewhere else if you want to do other things than just tummies. But, Going um, back to work after the... Yeah, so um, you're going to have drains in place for two weeks. Yep, so uh, two drains week one, one drain week two, um, staples in for two weeks. Uh, every other one comes out at week one, and then you see me at week two, I take the second drain and the rest of the staples. That's the main... What's that? Are they external drains you're talking about? Uh, drains that go from your inside of your abdomen. Yeah. That drains fluid off underneath the, I know, but the it's flap. External, so. It comes out to a little bulb, the same bulb you had after surgery. So you say we got ours out the first day. It's gone. No, no, no. That's after your weight loss surgery. We're talking about a tummy tucks. Oh. Tummy tucks. So it's the same as instructions. Tummy tucks uh, is a common term we use, or paniculectomy, abdominoplasty, it's all the same, but um, we put in drains there that stay oh, in for two weeks. I'm sorry. That's okay. How long are you off work? Off um, work? You know, believe it or not, even though you have an incision from hip to hip, um, they say it's less painful than your laparoscopic surgery. But I usually, I refill pain medicine way less, um, and uh, other than having a drain and staples, uh, I think people feel pretty good. So I'd say still a week, maybe two weeks, because you have a drain in, but really no more than two weeks. Is that because you don't go through muscle? Yeah, we don't go through muscle. Yeah, so you're not going to have the left side of pain. That real pain is not. Yeah, you're not going to have that at all. So, yeah, where we pull that up. So, and yeah, we don't go through muscle, and we, a lot of the nerves are, you feel numb almost. It's almost more of a numb feeling because we cut through all the nerves. So, when do you um, recommend doing that? When you maximize your weight loss. That Everybody's that? different. Oh. Everybody's different. You know, some people are ready at week year one, and some people are ready at three years. I mean, it's, I wouldn't do it until you've lost all that you want to lose, and you feel like you plateaued there, and you're happy there. And then I would do it. What exactly is the procedure for doing that? What do you do? Uh, like the technique, like yeah, how do we I mean, do it? Do you sure. So below the underwear line, we make an incision from hip to hip, and then um, we uh, free up for all the way down to this fascia layer, so the muscle layer, fascia layer. We 
free up to essentially make a, a flap. So we flap it all up like it's completely <laughs> released. All the way up to about your rib cage line. So underwear line all the way up to here is one big loose flap. And then we, we stretch that down where it would be, where it would hook up with the other half of the line below your underwear line. And we figure out how much we would need to take off. And then we cut off a section. And then we make a new belly button. It's the, same, it's the same actual belly button that you have, it's just a new hole where the belly button comes out. Um, so if you have mesh in, you we don't even go into the mesh area, because your mesh area is below that. Your mesh, your mesh sits on top of your fascia. Your mesh is not up in the fat and the, and the subcutaneous and, and skin layer of your, and that's the part we take off. So we leave the mesh intact. And if you're a lap band, we keep the lap band port intact. Um, all those things, um, but then we then we rehook that back up and we we sew it in three layers and then we staple the skin closed. Put drains underneath. It. So the so the incision will always be there as long from hip to hip, um, but it'll be hidden below the underwear line so you won't see it. Your belly button is will look like a belly button, and uh, but it's going to look. No, so it, yeah, so it's the same, so the belly button has blood supply to it, it's got a stock that has blood supply to it that hooks up underneath. We cut the belly button and leave all the blood supply hooked up, and then we bring it out in a new hole. Okay, so it's still your same, it's, same, it's the same inside belly button that you had before, it's just coming out of a new hole. It might look a little different. It's going to look a little bit different. But, but tummies without belly buttons look funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to have a belly button. So but that's why we can it. In your, I did a sleep surgery. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it takes about it takes a little it takes at least an hour and a half. Wow. For that. Okay. For the skin, yeah, for the tummy. Yeah. And usually we have two surgeons and me. Yeah, we want to take your time. So <laughs> I've heard that like surgeons actually so your muscles together, which I have no idea why. What's the difference? Some surgeons do. do that? Yeah, some people um, think that it, it works better to tighten the muscles up, the abdominal muscles. I, I don't know because we don't do that. It just hurts bad. It just hurts bad. Now we have, we have plicated muscles before, so somebody that's extremely um, floppy once we get in there or they have a lot of uh, abdominal girth still or you know they've lost a lot of weight but they still kind of have a, a round tummy we can plicate your muscles forward meaning we um, we kind of kind of almost create like a hot dog bun and then we tie them together right down the middle and but you're gonna hurt so just so we mainly just bring the muscles, the muscles together and tighten them. but it's gonna hurt a lot more but um, we that's a decision we make in trauma after you've already got me, after you've already after got me asleep. cut up with the yeah. other side. And that, the, the, the amount of time, I mean, I've done that once in the four years that I've been here. So, I mean, it just doesn't happen very often. We usually don't need to do that. Okay, last question. Okay. Sure, I can do two more. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'm going to be relocating. I'm relocating to Texas. Okay. I'm going to have a surgery here. I will do that for you. Oh, okay. I, the MB, I, MBQ, I look up anytime anybody moves, I find them at accredited center and surgeon. say that many. I'd say Dr. Hamilton and I do um, probably on average two a month maybe, one a month, two a month. I mean. But they're cheaper than a plastic surgeon. Oh yeah. Does the insurance ever pay for that? Uh, at other places. We don't do insurance. Yeah. Five thousand. Yeah. Five thousand? Yeah. That's it? That's it? Does that cover the hospital? Everything. Yeah. You got a plastic yeah. surgeon. It's $10,000 per body part. We'll talk at my one year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would it still be 5000 if you had to bring the muscles in? Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> we do whatever we need to do because it really doesn't take that much time to bring them in. Uh, Medicare or hand care? No. Medicaid? Well, no. Cash and care. It is 
Cosmetic, yeah. Yep. Yep. The I was doing the Lovelox shots. Lovenox. Yeah. I had no idea if this was here before because I never really noticed. But um, I got a big bruise here. Okay. And so I was kind of poking around and I found it kind of like a nodule. Okay. And I don't know, it's still there. And okay. I don't know if that was caused by the shot or if that was there before. Or I would just give, worry about you it. give it more time to go okay. away. I mean, <laughs> you bruise because when you inject the medicine in, it thins the blood right there at the, the capillary level. And also, you can cause a little scar tissue from that breathing. Okay, so that might be what that nodule yeah, is. Just keep an eye on it. Okay. <laughs> I, have one, I have one that's about this big surgery two years ago. Oh. Okay. That's what's so, okay. And I have to take them every time I have anything done because I'm already shooting. Yeah. I've got a whole bunch of knots. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that answered a good question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.